So this is Chris Lucas responding to the video that I was going to respond to. And, you know, he, did, he wouldn't know that. Uh, making arguments that I would suggest you don't make because they're easily falsified, like Jesus didn't rise on the day after the Sabbath. It's not in the Bible. And I'll just offer my... Um, the insight I think I have on this, if I, you know, maybe I'm wrong about something here, but I'll just play some of this and then respond because I agree with Chris that, um, I don't see any reason to think, uh, it's, it's now okay to pray to the saints for the same reason. Um, well, because they're calling Chris uses my arguments about, well, in the Bible, they're called the dead. There's no distinction in the text. In the New Testament, the saints that have died, that are asleep, it says. However you want to interpret that. Even if you interpret even if you interpret them that they're alive, even though Jesus just says like people are dead, they're the dead in Christ. Okay? They were like Chris says, which I've said too, in the in the Old Testament, under the first covenant, because the new covenant doesn't come until Jesus dies. Jesus is teaching under the law to redeem those who are under the law. And it's his sacrifice that uh, ratifies the old covenant, brings the new covenant that goes to the Gentiles also. And so while Jesus is teaching, you can't go to Matthew 22, say the saints are alive because Abraham never really died because no one really ever dies because Abraham's not the, is right, you know, God's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. So do you think they were dead before when they were called the dead and now that now they're also called the dead after the cross which is when jesus would presumably bring them out of uh, sheol or abraham's bosom or the grave which is what all the orthodox iconography shows they're in the graves now jesus has gone to the grave uh to ransom everybody out of the grave from death's grasp people don't think this through it's like do you think people went to heaven when they died in the old testament isn't your reason for not thinking, uh, or isn't your reason for thinking people are alive after they die before the resurrection because of, you know, stories you think implis imply that they're alive even though they've died? And then Jesus ransoms them from the grave because of the cross. That's Christianity, like at its basic foundational level. So like, so confused you should just believe what i believe which is that dead people aren't alive it's really that simple the bible doesn't teach anything distinct of that only tradition not that if you believe that you're not saved you're just wrong and it leads to other errors perhaps like thinking you can pray to dead people that scripture calls dead without a distinction other than that we're now ransomed from the grave so like yeah Moving on. Uh, as an intercessor for Israel, and he intercedes, and, and God decides not to destroy Israel based on the fact that Amos had interceded. So, um, what we get from that, and I know Amos was alive when he did that, but what we get from that is that the, the righteous man, right, the, the prayer of a righteous man is uh, effectual. Uh, so, the logic being, well, the prayer. Of I can stop it there. The prayer of a living righteous man, that's what we have seen in Scripture. The prayer of a living, righteous man who's on earth is effectual. I agree. I agree. But have we ever seen that witnessed in Scripture? That, that's the issue. Where it's like someone that's dead. On See, this is the issue for me. And by the way, I seven days a week, I would, I would rather talk to people who are Orthodox than most Protestants because... Um, you know, there's tension between me and my beliefs and the Orthodox beliefs, but they're doing it so much better. So I love the Faith Unaltered program. I, I, I can have interesting, deep conversations. Not that anyone's incapable on, um, you know, on the Protestant side, or not that anyone, everyone on the Protestant side is a bumptious idiot. It's just kind of like the bell curve. It's like, like Protestantism uh, regarding just talking about the Bible, not like pinching the buttons off of the couch seat. The Davenport is missing buttons, Grandma, because uh, my Protestant friends were visiting. I don't want to be like that. <laughs> so, you know, I can have these better conversations with them that are much more uh, 
edifying and interesting, even though I have to admit I do disagree very heavily on certain things. Um, I was going to say something else I forgot, but look, the, the Orthodox got you guys uh, as far as your, your arguments are bad. And I saw this as JP too, and it was so frustrating. I was like, dude, you know what I believe. I know you disagree, but it's like, it's so tired. You'll never win the argument against praying to saints when you guys agree that they're all still, they're ultimately in heaven. Why couldn't you ask them for help? They're not dead anymore. Even though the Bible says plainly that they doesn't say they're alive in heaven. It never says that explicitly anywhere, obviously, because if it did, I would believe it. Because I'm actually sola scriptura. I actually think we have to reform our beliefs about God and, the, and Jesus and salvation, theology in general, and it has to come from scripture because it's the only thing we can trust because that's the example Jesus gave us. And it's, the, and it's what he appealed to, even though he is speaking as God to the people who are the leaders of his people. Think about that. God's people on earth and the teachers of God's people on earth are being rebuked by God who could just tell them they're wrong and why. And what does he do? Because he, he shows, he tells them otherwise that he's the righteous judge, the, the Messiah. But when he's disputing with them over what's right doctrine... He refers to the written word, what God has said according to what is written. Haven't you read? Isn't that all you guys are supposed to do is read all the time? Don't you know this thing by heart? So he's rebuking the, the top tier teachers amongst the people of God who were called out by God to be show the world God his ways. God is sovereign. And he's rebuking the top of the leadership of his church. And, God, and he's there in the flesh. God himself, everything he speaks, is, is, uh, is the word of God. But he refers to the text. Like, to me, that's why, that's why I'm a Protestant. Even though it's a mess. But you're never going to beat them quote unquote, beat them. If they're going to say, yeah, living people on earth. Yeah, I agree. I agree too. I agree that uh, our prayers uh, mean something and it has an effect because that's the way God set it up. And that's what the Bible says. That's a great example of it. Now, yeah, but the, so if you're going to say, yeah, like what I do, that the text just says they're dead. That's why there's a resurrection, but you're going to say they're alive in heaven. You've, you've just, you hand it over yeah, but even you. That's why Sam Shimon. That's what Jay Dyer would tell you. They're not dead, right, idiot? That's what they're going to start with. Why? Because they know that's the only argument that's legitimate against their position. Well, we don't see it in the Bible, anybody praying to, this, to people after they've died. Um, yeah, but they're, that's before the cross. Now the cross has come. Now they're alive in heaven, and you agree. It's like you're, you're, if you think the saints are alive in heaven and you, you have fellowship with people on earth who are alive, they are, if you believe that, if you agree to that, they're more alive than ever, which even if you believe people who go to heaven when they die, people out there, if you're going to hold that belief, which is unbiblical, which undermines your, the whole Protestant proposition at its foundation, just like the Sabbath, you don't keep the Sabbath according to the text, and then that means you're saying the church has the authority to change it. If the church has the authority as an ecclesial body appointed by Christ on earth to change one of the Ten Commandments, and then you say, ah, uh, God is my witness, here I stand, I can do no other, because the Word of God says this, and then, you, and then you go and go, well, yeah, the church changed the Sabbath, but I'm not going to keep the Sabbath, but I'm going to be a Protestant and stand on the word of God. I'm sorry. You're being a hypocrite, in my opinion. Now, people have tried to make a case because they realize this horrible error that they've, been, that they've received from their fathers and they don't really care about their principles. They just want to defend their church. They'll, they have nothing to stand on. It's the same thing here with the dead thing. 
I'm the only... The, Adventists are the only real Protestants that aren't being hypocritical when, it, when you look at the Word of God and you actually say, I'm going to go with what the Word says. That's why everybody who's a Protestant calls us a cult, even though we believe all the same doctrines that are the primary doctrines of Christianity according to the vast majority of Protestants. So it's, we're a threat in that sense because they got nothing. Now, what am I saying? We don't say that you're not saved because you're not a Seventh-day Adventist. We say, if you're going to be a Protestant and stand on the principles of what the Protestant Reformation was about, and really you actually believe that that was true, that they did have to leave because of the witness of Scripture, and that is your standard. How can you not be an Adventist? Oh, because their eschatology is weird, even though it really actually isn't. It's a synthesis of what came before them through Protestantism. Standing on what scripture says in scripture alone regarding the rule of faith and doctrine. Again, I, I if I believe that uh, uh, saints were in heaven right now more alive than they are on earth, even though they haven't been resurrected and the purpose of God is that we're embodied, so saying you're more alive now than ever, depending on what you mean, I guess if I'm charitable, I'd be like, where do you get that from? That comes from a confused idea that the goal of, of, uh, of, of this world is to get to heaven and that's where you go without a body. That's, that is not the Hebrew uh, Judeo-Christian me- um, teaching. You shouldn't say that, even if you think you're alive in heaven. The purpose of God is for Jesus to wrap up history when he's put his enemies under his feet and destroys the, that which opposes God and puts us back in the state he originally intended for us, which is embodied in the creation. This world is what we're for, albeit in its, in its broken state. The other side, and don't get caught up on the, I know they love to get caught up on, no, they're alive in Christ. And dude, you know what? Unless you think uh, all the people before Jesus are dead in a grave, those people were, you know, and like not moving and you got some soul sleep doctrine, which I don't think you guys do, but unless you believe in some sort of soul sleep doctrine, then they were also, after they died on earth, they were alive somewhere, weren't they? But they were still called the dead. They were always referred to as the dead in the Bible, right? So don't, don't get, don't go there with me. Now we'll see, Chris, the difference they, were, they would say now is the difference of the cross. They were dead. Just like people die now, their body died. And you don't want to talk, you can't talk to them now. Whenever they talk about this, they always describe the Orthodox. And in this video, Jay Dyer does too. Every time he talks about it, he says, because they're in heaven closer to God without their imperfections. They've been, uh, their, their imperfections are removed. That's how they're in the presence of God. All right, so the difference is, would still be that um, although they may have been conscious and alive, uh, you know, consciously in the grave, now they've been ransomed out of the grave and they're in the presence of God. So they're, they've been redeemed because of the cross. And that's why they're taken to heaven based on the merits of Jesus, what he does. So they don't have to believe in soul sleep before the cross. Uh, in, in, in a, um, in a construction of the text, which, if, like I said, if you agree with them that they're in heaven now, what would keep, what would keep them from uh, the things that would have been unknown, well, in, say, Hades, prior to the cross, would have been a reason not to pray to them because they have not been perfected yet, and they're not in the presence of God in the communion of the saints, as they would, the Orthodox would say, they are now in heaven because of the harrowing of hell and Jesus overcoming the gates of Hades. So, you know, on one hand, I can appreciate your appeal to what the text says. I agree. The Bible, but the Bible makes no distinction. People who have died are called present tense dead by Jesus and others. And again, you like, appealing to Matthew 22 because you don't understand the context of Jesus quoting Exodus 3 and the fact that he's not talking about whether Abraham is consciously alive in heaven already. He certainly isn't in heaven yet, even if he is conscious. So appealing to Matthew 22 is saying Abraham is alive. He certainly isn't alive 
in the sense that um, he's in heaven already. Bef- you know, it's before the cross. But at the same time, if you if you concede that they're well, I guess they are in heaven. You know, they're without a body. You've just undermined every reason. Uh, you've conceded something that overcomes the purpose of not praying. All you can really appeal to is, well, we don't see any examples of it. And I guess if that, if, so I'm not going to, that's like, that's what um, Braxton Hunter said when I kind of posed this sort of question to him and Michael Jones. He's like, well, and he mentioned that. He's like, well, they're going to say, well, you guys believe they're in heaven too. So, uh, and then Braxton Hunter says, like a lot of Protestants who don't have a better answer, say, well, you know, I don't feel comfortable doing it because of its prohibition in the past, and I don't see anybody in the New Testament referring to doing that as a, something to, that we should do, or that there's a difference. Most people won't even appeal to the law at all at this point in history, because I guess we're not under the law, which if we're not under the law, then I guess anything goes, like praying to dead people, even if they are dead. Hell, we're not under the law. <laughs> that was for the Jews. Only God only wants the Jews to not pray to dead people. But the Christians can. Those poor Jews who needed Christ for their sins had this law they had to keep that is impossible to keep. Uh, so it can condemn them. And now Christians who have the power of the Holy Spirit uh, sent from heaven... So you, that you could follow Jesus, the same God as the Old Testament God. But now we don't have to keep it because we're not under it. But we're given the Holy Spirit in large measure so that we can walk in his righteousness that he showed us, which was not sinning, which is breaking God's law under the Old Covenant, which is what Jesus was under the entire time he was teaching, of mess- which ministry he uh, gave to his disciples and then told them to take that thing which he taught them to the nations. Does that make any sense? Ah, just throw it all away. And then God gave it to some dusty guys who have the Holy Spirit, which is supposed to write God's law in your heart. But really it just means do what we say because it's this new religion called Christianity. It has nothing to do with Judaism and the Hebrew culture. And We want to follow Jesus, but it was teaching entirely under the law of Moses. But then he does away with it and sends his Holy Spirit to write that law, which was the law of Moses in the Old Testament in context, on our hearts, which is nothing like the New Covenant. In fact, if it's in the Old Covenant, it's not in this one because this one's new. And new means Jesus is a different God with different ideas and rules about righteousness. Good luck with that. So all we know is, yes, uh, living people... The, the righteous living, their prayers can intercede. For those who have- there you go. You believe they're alive in heaven. Game over for you. You have nothing to stand on other than, well, I don't see anybody else doing it, so I'm not going to do it. That's honest when people say that. It's honest. It's also, ev- it's also proof that you got nothing to, to say they can't do it. You know, I what do you mean can't do it? They can do whatever they want. I would just say, hey guys, I think it's still applicable from the Old Testament because Jesus is the same God and dead people aren't alive. That's why there's a resurrection. And the whole idea of disembodied spirits going to heaven before the resurrection and before the judgment is weird. And um, albeit I think an early accretion, if you will, or or mistake that was able to uh, come in. It's not like because people believe that their God isn't going to accept them. It's not my point. My point is uh, the only way you're going to have any reason to tell someone they can't do something is if the people aren't alive. And if you if you if you sit if you agree with them that they're alive, you got nothing. Gone on to be in the presence of the Lord is also perhaps more effectual. 
uh, because they are directly in the presence of God. They've been uh, purged from whatever attachments or, uh, you know, sins they might have had in this life. And so having been perfected, uh, they are in a better position. And so that's why we see in the book of Revelation. I think part of, I have to be honest, I go back and forth. I have friends that are Orthodox and friends that are Protestant and I like, I like appreciate them for different reasons. So I don't mean to be offensive because my, my, uh, my old self comes out here and there, I guess. I also don't like the idea though of, oh, hey, I'm going to be nice to you so I can slowly try to convert you. It's like, look, I, I'm just looking past that. I just want to talk about what the Bible teaches, what scripture teaches and, you know, philosophy in the church and, and what it means. I like to talk about what it means to, uh, image Christ to the world to say, get people saved. So like, that's really what I want to do on, online talking about Christianity, theology or whatever. But, um, what, what, uh, I think if I was, if I thought the saints were alive in heaven and I really was going to believe and live my faith, uh, I don't think I could really would be against it in one sense. I guess someone could convince me of otherwise. I kind of go back and forth on this, but it's like, to me, the linchpin is whether or not they are in heaven already. If they are, then it's kind of ambiguous whether or not you should, you know, call on them to help you. Why wouldn't you? They would be in a position to help you, wouldn't they? But on the other hand, it's like God said not to talk talk to people who have died. It is different to talk to somebody. Uh, In one sense, it's similar. In one sense, it's different. There's a difference between talking to someone in front of you who's a friend that you fellowship with in the in the flesh in as a, and by that I just mean in person in a living body as the only way we understand um, living the Christian life is embodied living people anything else is uh, at best speculation and at worst worst false doctrine slash misunderstanding mm-hmm. of the reality of the world about life and death and what is the hope of the faith exactly seems like it's Jesus returning to take us to heaven for the marriage supper of the Lamb. But people hear that and they go, oh, you believe in the rapture. No, I don't believe in the pre-trib crazy rapture. I believe in the historic premillennial rapture that the early church believed in. And the early creeds go with. That Jesus is coming back to do what? To judge the living and the dead. Because the scripture says he separates the sheep and goats at his glorious appearing and not before. This is an interesting thing too. The saints, why would they be in heaven already when Jesus told the disciples, you can't go where I'm going, but I'm going to come back for you. And because he's the judge. And when he talks in his ministry about being the judge, it's an event at the end of the world, which corresponds with the physical resurrection, which Catholics and Orthodox agree with. But if you agree that you can lose your salvation in this life and that it's over once you die... And then Jesus says he has to come back for his people and they're gathered together to meet Jesus in the air and be taken to the Father's house at a gathering, a great multitude. It's a great multitude on the Sea of Glass he sees. Because in context, Jesus has wrapped up the ages by returning and getting his people and destroying his enemies, which hasn't occurred yet. Anyway... See, I'm just depending on what the text says and not tradition. If I was to do the other, I would be confused about what the inspired and fallible word of God that the early church was using to base its doctrine on originally and what Jesus appealed to, to the leader of God's people. The sovereign God's people's teachers were rebuked by God in the flesh who could have just spoken with authority but instead referred to what is written as because he's our example of a human to how to depend on God as a human being because he took on our suffering and overcame to show us the way and make us make a way. That guy, when he became a human and accomplished that, didn't appeal to his authority, even though it would have been totally legit to do so. No, he was showing us the way. And when he was showing us the way and rebuking the top tier leaders of God's people, appointed as teachers by God, God himself said, it is written. Have you not read? 